Good morning, friends. We're very happy you're with us today for worship here on September 6th. It's another good day to be at Manassas Baptist Church, and we are inside for worship today, and you're with us online, and we're very happy that you're connecting with us online this morning. Do me a favor as you worship, please take one second and log in on Facebook or YouTube or wherever you are and let us know where you're watching from. We appreciate knowing where you're watching from. Today is our second Sunday back in the building. Next Sunday, we're going to be in opening the building up for, for whoever would like to join us. We'll ask that you join us, at least register in advance for us so that you can go to our website and you can let us know how many people will be with you. If you don't have the access to the internet, you can contact our secretary, Anna, and she'll help you with that. So next week, we'll be back in the building even, even more so. I want to also remind you that we have some small groups that are meeting on a regular basis now. Some are now starting to meet together and in actual person, and they're doing a blended style where some people are going to be in the room and others are going to remain connected on Zoom. If you'd like to connect with one of our small groups, we would love to help you get connected in that capacity. One final way that you can join us in worship is by participating through our offerings. And I want to remind you that you can do that by going online and making a, a donation through your tithe or offering through our website. You can do that by texting, texting to give 77977, or you could mail your tithe or offering in however you'd like. Friends, we're happy you're with us. It's another good day to celebrate God's grace and God's favor in our lives. And I'm going to invite you to join me in a moment of prayer. And we will continue with our time of worship. Father, thank you for this day, for the time that we can be together, for the people who are connected in the building and those who are connected online this morning. We are grateful for the privilege we have to hear your word, to proclaim your word, to sing praise to your name, to gather in prayer, and to find encouragement as we journey through this life together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We invite you to join us in a call to worship this morning. Each time after I speak, if you would share the words, we are here to worship. And at the end, after six times of responding, we are here to worship, if you'll say a strong amen. With open arms, you welcome all who call on your name. We are here to worship. We acknowledge you as Lord and look to you in faith. We are here to worship because no one stands outside the circle of your mercy and love. We are here to worship. We declare that you are our God and that we are your people. We are here to worship because we are called and chosen by you from the very beginning. We are here to worship. Through the presence of your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see you here. Open our minds to receive your truth and our mouths to speak and sing your praise. We are here to worship. For you alone are God, worthy of all praise and worship, now and to the end of time. Amen.
friends, at this time in our worship gathering, we want to take a few moments and pray for some things that are happening in our church. We want to invite you also to join us and pray prayers of thanksgiving for some things that we're thankful for that have taken place. A couple of prayer matters. First is this. Jan Rail is a longtime member of our church. She's kind of our, our church nurse, if you will. She's cared for a lot of people, both in, that in the hospitals and in sickness, but also for people in our congregation. And Jan has been struggling with some extraordinary pain in her back. She told me that it's the first time in her life she's ever experienced a, a level 10 type pain on a, on, a back, on a back situation. So I invite you to be in prayer for Jan as they try to work out what's going on with her and remember her. A second prayer request is a friend of mine named Keith. Keith was just diagnosed with uh, lymphatic cancer, and he's down at VCU and getting some attention and some care and trying to determine what, what next best things are, and so we invite you to pray for Keith. His mom and dad called me very upset, asking that we pray, and so I'll invite you to pray for Keith with me. Some things to share as a word of thanksgiving. And uh, last Sunday, you had the opportunity to watch a video of my new friend, Sharita Rouse, the lady who makes the candied apples. I want you to know something, that... Not only did people here in Manassas respond to that by going and buying some apples and doing some things, but people all over the country who watched that video have been ordering apples and buying apples, and those apples are being shipped. I walked into the post office one day this week, and there was a long line of people, and at the front of the line was Sherita Rouse, and she was shipping off apples all over the United States. And I appreciate you supporting her and supporting her work and her ministry. That's a beautiful thing. Second thing that's kind of neat. Last Sunday night after church, we uh, had a gathering. Mary Beth had a gathering for children who are promoting from kindergarten to first grade or second grade to third grade or, and some other kids who are going into our youth program. We were going to have a small program outside, and it turned into having almost 200 people out on our backfield, and it was absolutely beautiful to see our families, our children, to see the excitement, the fun. There was just a lovely uh, evening just to see so many people gathered on our property together. I have missed that, and I so enjoyed doing that and being a part of that. And finally, last Sunday, we had our first regathering in the building for worship. 120 people showed up inside to be inside for worship. And I have to tell you, that's about double what I anticipated. I was not expecting more than 50 or 60. And to see that many people show up was very good to my heart. And I, I understand there are going to be a lot of people that are not going to come back for a long time, and I get that. But it was awfully nice to see people back in the building last Sunday for worship. I look forward to seeing you when you're able to be there. I, if you come by the building to, to stop off and drop something off or whatever it might be, it's always good to see you. Would you join me for a moment of prayer as we think about these prayer needs, but also to pray a prayer of thanksgiving for other grace gifts that God has given us. Father, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful for the opportunity that we can focus in on your word where we can be encouraged by music, where we can hear what you have, your Spirit has to say to us. Father, as the body of Christ that meets at Manassas Baptist Church, it's our privilege to stand in the gap for some friends who are going through some difficult places. We pray for our friend Jan and just ask God for grace and mercy as, as the doctors try to determine what's going on with her back and get her some relief. We pray for my friend Keith as he's in the hospital down at VCU in Richmond trying to ascertain what the next best steps are for him. And we pray that there will be answers and that there will be some, some good direction for his story as he goes forward. Father, we know there are some other prayer needs that are going on in our congregation for situations that people just aren't comfortable in sharing publicly. And we, we ask God that you would meet these folks in the difficult places where they are, that they might find hope and they might find life and they might find strength and they might find peace for the challenge before them. And Father God, we never, we never want to miss saying thank you for the gifts that you give us saying thank you for the people who came to gather inside for worship last Sunday. Thank you for the families and the children who came last Sunday evening to say thank you for the people who've been supporting the, the ministry that Sharita Rouse is doing in, here in Manassas. God, that's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. We're grateful, Father, for the way you walk with us. You give us life, you give us hope, and you give us encouragement. And we pray, God, that we never fail to recognize your grace gifts and say thank you. You're worthy of our worship. You're worthy of our praise and our adoration. And we are grateful to be in your presence today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hey friends, we are at the time now when we share the message this morning and I invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of Acts in Acts chapter 2. And we'll be focusing in today on this message from Acts chapter 2 addressing one of the foundational pieces of who we are as followers of Christ. Message series for the next five weeks is going to be addressing the idea of what's next. For the last six months, our church and churches all around the United States and churches all around the world have been addressing the reality of what COVID looks like. We've experienced the challenges in our economic system. We've seen challenges in the, in the system of our education and our health system and our political system. Across the board, we have seen challenges and changes to every venue of life. Churches are no different. And we're wondering, I'm wondering, what in the world is church life going to look like next? What's it going to look like in the next three months, six months, 18 months? What's it going to look like as we, as we go forward? When we consider for just a bit that in the United States, we've lost almost 200,000 people to COVID. That's a lot of people. We have a, an immense loss around the rest of the world, but in our nation, we've experienced this and we've seen this and we've tried to watch, walk through some things. We understand that we would like to think that in the next three months or the next two months or as soon as possible, we'll have a vaccine or we'll start developing some, glo some antibiotics to this address or this will just go away. But the reality is we don't know. And so what's it going to look like for our churches to continue to gather and to continue to do the things that we need to do to be the church, to be the foundational piece of who we are as followers of Christ? Friends, this isn't the first crisis that the global church has had to face. We've dealt with global conflict. We've dealt with civil war. We've dealt with pandemics in the past. We've dealt with immense poverty. We've dealt with natural disasters that, that have just been devastating. And yet the church and churches have continued to function and do the things that churches are supposed to do. We've continued to care for the sick. We've continued to house the homeless. We've continued to provide clothing for those who are in jeopardy. We've continued to help families and help people in need. But what's next for us if we can't get in the building, if you can't get in the building and be here? Well, one of the pieces of the biblical story of the church image is the fact that we have various purposes that we're supposed to do. We're supposed to gather for worship. We're supposed to be a part of the discipleship process of becoming like Christ. We're supposed to minister to others. We're supposed to have an opportunity to fellowship. We're supposed to share our faith story. And the Bible does not seem to teach that during a global pandemic or a global catastrophe, that gets to stop. So I understand we have to make some adjustments and we have to make some changes. But what is next for us as we look at this? So I want you to follow along with me as I read in, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, and starting in verse 42, about this idea about what comes next in terms of worship. Here's what the Bible reads. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles, and all the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, and they praised God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When we see this image of what the church was doing in Acts chapter 2, when it was just beginning, we see a very quick glimpse of what the purpose of the church looked like. We see people who are gathering together to worship. We see people who are gathering together for discipleship. We see people gathering together to grow closer to Christ and grow closer to one another in fellowship. We see people who are ministering in the name of Jesus and sharing their story. And we see people who are evangelizing and people are coming into the community of faith. The Bible reads that the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. And so those pictures, that picture of the church and how it was operating and what was happening, is a pretty profound image of what that looks like. I, I want to show you a, a quick picture. And this, this picture is, a, is of a church. I, I, I would like to tell you it's a Baptist church, but you're going to see pretty quick it's not a Baptist church for one primary reason. And the first reason is the speaker's wearing a robe. And I know there might be a Baptist minister out there who might preach in a robe, but there's not a whole lot of them. The second reason you know it's not a, you might think it's not a Baptist church is on the back wall you can see the Stations of the Cross. I haven't seen too many Baptist churches like that. But the real reason 
You can tell this is not a Baptist church is all those pictures of the people that are all up front. And if that was a Baptist church, all those pictures would be in the back because they're all sitting in the back. We have to see the adjustment that they're, they're making in that, in that capacity. There's another image I want you to look at, and this image is more of a reflection of, of what our church might look like in the coming days. You can see this image of this church with limited attendance. You can see people spread out. You can see people wearing masks as they gather. And in that image that you see, you are seeing the church adapt. You're seeing the church change. You're seeing the church adjust to some challenges that are all out there. But the reality is, the purpose of the church remains to worship, to disciple, to evangelize, to minister, and to have fellowship. And right now, we might not be in a physical proximity, but what, what's next is we're making some adjustments to how that looks. So whether you're going to be in our building or whether you're going to gather outside with us in a couple of weeks or whatever it is you might do, you might be staying at home alone because of, of your susceptibility to COVID. I want you to hear that as we go forward in COVID, as we go forward in what's going on, our call to worship, our call to be disciples, our call to minister, our call to fellowship, our call to share our faith story, it doesn't change. That still remains. How we do it, we've got to be, find some flexibility to make that happen. So today we're talking about worship. And I want you to focus in on it with me for just a bit about what that might look like for you and what that might look like for me as we go forward. And the, one of the pictures that I think is important for us to hold on to is a text that's found in the book of Romans in Romans chapter 12. In Romans 12, 1, the Bible reads this way. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Typically, we gather in large groups for worship. Sometimes we gather in small groups for worship. But friend, you can also gather by yourself or one other person for worship. You can. It's a time when you turn your heart, your mind, and you start focusing in on what God has to say. And so five things I want to talk about this idea of what worship looks like. And the first one is this. I want to remind you that worship is our response to God's love. Worship is our response to God's love. When we have seen and we've experienced and we have tasted and we have watched God's grace and God's love and God's mercy and God's provision, and we've seen how God has walked with us through some pretty amazing days and some pretty hard days, worship is our expression of recognizing God's love. And we do that with music. We do it with prayer. We do it by reading the Word. We do it by listening to the Word. We do it by experiencing the Holy Spirit. And we do it by turning our focus and our attention on God. We do that by lining our hearts and our lives and our minds up to what we understand God's will is for us. So when we think about what worship is, it's our response to God's love. In the Jewish temple, in Jesus' day, in Roman temples 2,000 years ago, in whatever other religious expression 2,000 years ago, if you went to worship, something was going to die. There was going to be a sacrifice made and something was going to die. In the New Testament, the images of what we sacrifice, it's ourselves. And the Apostle Paul said, we are to be a living sacrifice. We are to be a living sacrifice that's holy and acceptable to God. That is what is true worship, that we live our life in a sense and an attitude of worship reflecting God's grace and God's mercy in our story. Worship, it's our response to God's love. The second thing, worship is giving back to God. Now think about that for just a second. Worship is giving back to God. How do you give back to God. I mean, I can't write a check and toss it up there, and I can't throw enough money up there where he will get that. How do I give back to God? I have a very good friend that I grew up with, and he is from southern Illinois, and he has been extraordinarily successful in his industry, and he, he has made immense amounts of money. His bonus last year was a six-figure bonus, not his salary, but a bonus. 
There's nothing that I can give my friend that he can't buy or get or do whatever he wanted to do. He's extraordinarily successful. He's got a beautiful family. He's got a beautiful wife. And there's nothing I can give him that he might need except for one thing, and that's time. And sometimes he might call me and we'll talk about this, that, or the other. We'll process through some challenges that are going on and perhaps I can give him a little advice or maybe a little bit of an encouragement, but there's nothing tangible that I can give my friend that he can't already purchase or buy because he's loaded. And so when we think about worship is giving back to God, what does that look like? Well, that looks a little bit like our adoration, and it looks a little bit like our offering with our tithe and our, our giving. It looks a little bit by our attention and our focus and what we, we hold on to. In fact, Jesus said, when he was questioned what the most important commandment was, Jesus said, the most important commandment there is is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your strength. And perhaps what we give back to God is our time. What we give back to God is our talent. What we give back to God is our our treasure. What we give back to God is our, our trust. And when Jesus says, love God with all of your heart, that's expressing that we love God passionately, that we know Him in an intimate way. When Jesus says that we love God with all of our soul, the soul is our center of thinking and our center of of where we process things. And perhaps we love God by considering why He is worthy of our time and our attention and our treasure. And when we think about loving God with all of our strength, we consider how we practically engage, how we practically invest ourselves in, in loving God and expressing that to God. So as we start thinking about what's next, I'm telling you, friends, worship is a part of what's next. And it might not be in this room, and it might not be in this building for a while, but it most definitely looks like that we are giving back to God our adoration and our attention and our focus, that we're sharing our time and our talent and our treasure with Him. The third piece of what worship looks like, I think, is that we are focusing our attention on God. We're focusing our attention. I'm not saying 24-7, seven days a week, but I'm saying that we set aside a a period of time in our, maybe in our day or maybe in our week or maybe in in a season where we can focus in on what God might be saying to us as individuals and collectively as a family and perhaps as a, as the body of Christ that meets at Manassas Baptist Church. For a second, I want you to think what would happen in your family if you gave no attention to your spouse if you gave no attention to your children, if you gave no attention to your parents or your grandparents, what would the relationships be like if all you did when you were at home was on your phone or on your email or on the television and you weren't engaging with the most important people in your world? What about your friends? People that you've grown up with or people that you enjoy hanging out with or people you enjoy spending time with, if you don't give them any attention or give them any time or phone calls or funny text messages or whatever it might be, how do you expect to maintain that friendship? And perhaps we might even want to consider we're driving and we're not paying attention to the road and we're looking at our phone or we're messing with the radio or we're doing whatever it might be and we're not paying attention to that. Friends, Some bad stuff can happen pretty quick. There are certain things in life we have to pay attention to or we're going to lose some things. And I think one of the images that we have about focusing our attention on God is that there's this this beautiful text that we see in Romans chapter 12 that kind of expresses this. Listen to what Paul wrote. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in even without thinking about it. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. In my thinking, that means that at some point in our week, at some point in our day, we need to be able to focus on something that's bigger than us, that's greater than us, that's more beautiful than us, something that provides joy and something that's compelling and something that's challenging, something that's holy and something that is supreme. And in the course of our journey, in the course of our life, in the course of being a follower of Christ, on a regular basis, we have to turn our attention to our Father. And how do we do that? We do that by being in His Word. We do it by praying. We do it by sometimes quieting down and reflecting and considering. We do that by ourselves. We can do that in a group. 
We can do that in a small group. And the image is, one of our next steps is that we turn our affections to our Father. Fourth piece that I want you to consider what what worship looks like is that worship is very clearly expressing our affection, our love, our adoration, our appreciation to our Father. Our worship experience is expressing our affection, our appreciation, our love to our Heavenly Father. And I want you to hear, it's very important to me that when I gather with God in a time of prayer by myself or I'm gathering with you and we're praying together corporately, that we begin every prayer time or at least we pause for just a bit just to say thank you, God, for the blessings that we have all around us. And guys, I understand we've got a lot of challenges around us right now, but the reality is we have been inordinately blessed by God's hand. And it is vitally important that we take some time to pause and express our affection and our adoration and our appreciation for what God the Father has done. Listen to what the prophet Hosea said. He said, I don't want your sacrifice. I want your love. I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me. This past weekend, when I mentioned earlier about Mary Beth's gathering with the children, one of the things that Mary Beth did is she made certain that everybody was wearing masks and all of us were wearing masks outside. But what she also did for the children is she gave all the children rain gear. And we put on rain gear last Sunday night and this rain gear was long-sleeved and it went down to about their knees and they sealed it up and they put it over their head, and then she said, any of the kids who want a hug, you can get a safe hug. And I wish you'd have seen all the children hugging their small group leaders and hugging their friends. It was a beautiful piece to watch those kids. We're missing an expression of that kind of affection. My wife and I were walking in our neighborhood a couple of weeks ago, and as we were walking, we passed a mom and her two little girls in their driveway. And as we stopped to talk to them, the littlest one ran right up to my wife and wanted to give Veronica a hug. Now, we didn't know this family, didn't know these children, but that little girl wanted to give somebody a hug, and her mother grabbed her real quick, not necessarily because Veronica was a stranger, but because of the COVID situation. There's an 80-plus-year-old member of our congregation. I was having a conversation with him the other day, and he told me that if he gets a phone call late in the day, it's kind of sad that he'll be clearing his voice and the person will say, I'm sorry, did I wake you up? And Russell told me, he said, no, they didn't wake me up. But at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, it's kind of sad to say this is the first person I've spoken to all day. Friends, that's hard. And one of the images that we have in this season is we're missing that affection. And part of our worship experience is expressing our affection, our adoration, our love to our Heavenly Father. Some of us can sing like an angel. Some of us can play a piano or play guitar or play the drums. We can do all kinds of expressions of what that looks like in a variety of ways. Some of us might be like Marvin Robertson. And we can create things with our hands. And Marvin makes in beautiful, beautiful nativity sets. Some of us might be like Becky Verner and we can write. And you've heard her some of the things that she's written. And you can see how she expresses her love in writing. Some of us might be like Linda Nadilski. And we can create some beautiful things in painting or in art. However you experience and want to express your affection to your Father, do it. Because that's a part of what worship looks like. And the final piece that I want to encourage you with is worship is ultimately using our abilities, using our skills for God. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your spirit, and all your strength. He said, this is the greatest command. And I want you to hear very clearly, most of us cannot live our lives in a monastery and just love God in that vertical relationship. Most of us have to work. Most of us have to take care of a family. Most of us have to care for people that we love and we're invested in. Most of us have things that we have to do in our life. And I want you to hear what I think that means in in the Gospel of Mark, that in light of God's love for, of our love for God, we do 
all of those things. We work in light of God's love. We serve in light of God's love. We love our families. We care for our families. We care for our neighbors in light of God's love. Paul wrote this in Colossians 3. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for man. Whatever you do. So my friends out there who are serving as a nurse or serving as an electrical technician or serving as a sales rep or serving as a work in the government or a soldier or a student or a teacher or, or whatever field of endeavor you might be, whatever you do, use your ability as an expression of your worship and of your love for God and the way you want to honor him and celebrate the gifts that he's given you. What's next in this term of worship? What's next for us is, well, we adjust, we maneuver, we adapt, but we continue to worship. We continue to gather and we address this. We are in a dark, hard season. There's no getting around that. And worship and focusing in on God and finding strength from our Father, it's a monumental piece of us navigating through these hard days. Do not miss it. In just a few moments, I'm going to be baptizing a little boy in the 11 o'clock service. His name's Alex, and he made a decision to follow Jesus a couple of months ago, and we've been delaying this whole process to, to baptize him because of COVID. Some of you watching today, you might need to make a decision to trust Christ, to say, yes, I want to follow Jesus, and yes, you need to take a step of following him. Friends, I want to, I'd love to chat with you and talk with you about what that would look like for you. Because as we try to navigate what's next in this world, Having Jesus in, our, Jesus in our heart is a huge element of how we thrive in these next steps of life. What's next for Manassas Baptist? Well, we're going to worship. We're going to focus in on our Creator. We're going to honor Him with our lives. We're going to give to Him our adoration and our love. We're going to serve Him with our abilities and our talents. That's kind of what's next. It might be in this building. It might be in your home. You might join us outside. But we are going to worship our Father. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to gather in the name of Jesus today. We pray that you speak to our hearts, that we might find encouragement in your word, that we might find encouragement and strength in this season of worship, that we might find and experience your love and your grace and your hope as we follow you. Hear our prayer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.